Welcome everybody to this week's Rising Tide Foundation lecture, where we are continuing our brief little journey through some underappreciated <laughs> fights throughout history. Um, last week we had something by Richard Cook, which went through a recasting of American history at a battle over the banking structures, which I think set the stage very nicely for Nancy Spanis, who once again has been gracious enough to offer us a, a little peek into what will become very soon a brand new book hitting the bookshelves shortly on the very, very important issue of slavery and the origins of America. Obviously, there's a lot of attacks right now and, and efforts to rewrite history, and especially American history, as though the, the, the Republic itself was founded upon hypocrisy, slavery, evil, and all of those beautiful words are just meaningless nothings. Uh, maybe it would even be better for those who think in the, these terms, like the 1619 Project devotees, that the U.S. just disappeared from the scene and 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 we we find something more pure and authentic. Anyway, that's that's insane. But this is being fed to us a lot in our zeitgeist currently and Nancy has really gone on the forefront to do battle with this thing and show put the light on the reality of of the battle of the American founding fathers um before during and after the revolution. So Nancy without further ado, thank you so much for giving the time and the stage is all yours. Okay, so um as I looked it up it looked like I last spoke to you about this subject in January of 2021, um, when I was starting to look more seriously. And it was after that I decided that I was had to write a book on this subject, uh, which this is the evolution of the title of the book. Uh, it's not yet, don't yet have an ISBN but I will probably do that soon. Um, had a lot of discussion back and forth with my husband and my son on the title <laughs> um, to try to give it something catchy, but comprehensive and not too negative, they say. So, um, so as opposed to the persistence of slavery, it's the potential of the United States, both in the anti-slavery activity and in the economic policies of Alexander Hamilton. And since I talked to you before, I've drafted the whole book. Um, it concludes with a number of a fairly long appendix of documents, which many people are unaware of, all from the period. All of this goes up effectively to the year 1833 which is the, in my view, uh, and Henry Carey's and John Quincy Adams's, so I think I'm in good company, um, uh, the turning point toward the Civil War. So in the United States. So the, what we're, what I'm doing today is to give you a, uh, chapter by chapter review of how I developed the story. Um, I'm, and we'll see how it goes. Um, this is a still a work in progress because it hasn't actually been put in print. Um, I'm sort of struggling with the question of how to put it on Amazon because it's well, I submitted it to a lot of university presses and was got some very nice rejections <laughs> from these university presses. Um, the uh, I finally decided on advice and common sense, basically, that if you really wanted to get what you had to say out there, as Matt knows, you can't give your ownership of your manuscript to some company which just might change it all because <laughs> um, they have the rights to do so. So I have to publish on Amazon. It's sort of a technical challenge, but you know I'm going to try to do that. And you are looking at, you are going to hear basically a penultimate version of what I have uh, written and intend to say. It will not be complete, of course, and you know, I'm certainly open to questions um, to that I can elaborate on, or if I can't elaborate on, I will take them into consideration um, in 
working on working the book to completion. So my preface begins with the paradox, the paradox of on the one side, this statement by Gordon Wood, uh, that the American Revolution created the first anti-slavery movement in the history of the world, uh, versus the fact that ultimately it only ended with the Civil War. Um, this reality is can be elaborated and is elaborated throughout the context of the book. And it becomes, my argument is that not only can you demonstrate that this in-depth movement existed, but uh, you can point to certain specifics, right? Like the first anti, as far as I can see, the first anti-slavery organization in the world was established in Pennsylvania in 1775 uh, by Anthony Benizet. Um, and that uh, this was one of the symbols of that movement at, over time. It was actually devised in England because this was an international movement, but the impetus came from the people in the American colonies. Uh, that is where the driving force which created an international movement uh, existed. And I also argue that this could be realized, but could only be realized if the an economic system that promised an alternative to slavery also existed. And that in the United States, the nascent United States, that economic system existed. It was created in, in principle by Alexander Hamilton. And this is the symbol basically of what Alexander Hamilton's alternative was, was a shift to an industrial economy, something that would give uh, the, give economic independence to the United States and would elevate an the population out of a condition of de facto slavery in terms of its being a raw material supplier to Europe, but actual slavery, freeing it from actual slavery as well. Now, uh, this necessity for combining the moral opposition to slavery and the appropriate economic system was elaborated by key American system spokesmen. And the two, one of which I certainly mentioned before, uh, one of them was Matthew Carey uh, in 1819, saying that your, all of your major crises in, an, in a nation are the result of vital and radical errors in its system of political economy. I mean, he dealt then with a problem which is much more severe today, which is that your average citizen doesn't want to think about political economy. Uh, they uh, simply want to think about whether things cost too much or whether they're getting fair treatment themselves or what. But political economy has to be the concern of the average of a, a citizen. And then Henry Carey also indicating, and I find this quite a evocative quote, because what he's saying here is that if that the Declaration of Independence itself implied the necessity for an economy of independence, of economic independence. And of course, that kind of economy means that you have to have a manufacturing sector as well as an agricultural sector. You have to have a move toward actually technological progress, constant technological progress, if you're going to have uh, actual independence of the nation. 
So that's uh, extremely evocative. And I hope to give substance to that kind of idea in the course of the book. Now, but Hamilton was defeated, right? Um, in the early, by the early 1800s. Not totally because Jefferson wanted to eliminate the bank right away, but he was unable to do so. Um, but the whole concept of the Jefferson administration, the Madison administration, going up to the beginnings, uh, almost to the end of the Monroe administration, was the view that manufacturing should remain in Europe um, and that the government should be hands off in terms of economic development. Uh, maybe we should have a constitutional amendment, but that's not urgent and we're not going ahead with that, but uh, leave it to the states. Don't have any guiding hand uh, for economic development and improvement coming from the federal government and certainly don't have tariffs that might interfere with the export of our plantations. Uh, so, Nan Nancy, just a quick yeah. question. Um, I, we, I, we lost your PowerPoint um, about- I did. Yeah, about 30 seconds ago. Um, would you be able to reshare your PowerPoint? Do a, a share screen once more? Okay. I still see it. Oh, you still see it? Oh, okay. Never mind. Ignore yep. what I just said. Also well, I just it. did it. <laughs> okay. okay. Very weird. Okay. 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 It's good. It's good now. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. There's something All weird right. on our side. All right. All right, it actually gave me a sign that said, you can now see my application. <laughs> so maybe um, there was something wrong. So anyway, um, effectively he was defeated at least for uh, in bulk, almost entirely for 20 years, which of course gave life to the slave system, which um, created enormous problems socially uh, made it much harder to try to implement a system that would reverse uh, that kind of political economy and, and moral evil. So um, the coup de grace was given in 1833 when Jackson eliminated the National Bank, the second bank of the United States, you know, insisted on uh, states' rights, except when it came to his power, um, and insisted there not, not be national direction of infrastructure development, and went to placate the Southern states in terms of the tariff. So that was the turning point. Um, and that's the direction that I take in the book. So starting with chapter one, these are the slave, the titles of, of the chapters, but what I'm giving you is just a small amount of what is actually in there for uh, uh, elaborating the point. This overall first chapter is extremely brief um, because I'm not really in a position to give a full picture of slavery uh, um, coming into the, the population of the North American continent. So, um, but this map, which I believe I showed um, in 2001, I'm, I mean, in 2021, I'm not really sure, um, but uh, it gives sort of the overview of the international nature of and the role, the small, relatively small role that the slave sending the enslaved to North America played in that. Um, I have hence read that the flow of slaves to the East was actually greater than the flow of slaves from Africa uh, to the West. Um, 
And that is quite significant, of course, because in the chapter, I make a special point of the slavery in India, because that India being a sort of similar kind, uh, in my view, a, a similar kind of jewel of the empire as North America, uh, had a totally different outcome, obviously, uh, for many generations. And it continued to be enslaved uh, throughout the entire colonial period at a certain point in name only, and you know, not in name, but in actuality. Uh, so giving a picture of that, what actually was done there in terms of destroying their, their textile industry to make them, an, uh, you know, to impoverish their population and turn them into an, a, a population of, of slaves totally dependent and controlled militarily as well as economically by the British Empire. So it's sort of a quick overview to indicate how much of a international problem this was. I think my first sentence is, you know, slavery was invented in America, right? That was a headline in the Washington, in the Wall Street Journal uh, during right two days after the 1619 project came out um, because the way that slavery was being treated in the United States was as if it had been invented here in the United States. So then we get into what really is concerning in this book, which is in the American colonies. And right up front, it's clear that uh, slavery existed everywhere in the colonies. And it was less extensive in the, in the North, but it was, it was there as much as 10 years after the founding of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, it was not encouraged, but it was legitimized um, uh, as uh, as an institution. So it really begins to take off. That's really in the 1640s. It, it begins to take off, well, well, and then it exists in areas of colonization from other nations other than Great Britain. Um, the Spanish have their enclaves of slavery here. I don't deal with that in this presentation. Um, there's also some slavery among the American Indians, uh, which is indicated in some Scott, some brave scholarly journals. And there's also, as I will indicate, uh, slavery from the Dutch. So, but the British really begin to take off on this, uh, the importation in the 1650s after the reestablishment of the of uh Char with Charles II. So uh it begins to take off. They find in New York when they take over New York and shortly thereafter, 1664, that slavery already exists uh from the Dutch and although everyone says it's a much milder form of slavery, blah, 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 but it was slavery nonetheless. And actually one of the conditions of the handover from the Dutch to, the, to Great Britain was that slavery would continue. And you find this throughout the subsequent history. The Dutch areas of New York and New Jersey are where slavery is most entrenched um, over decades. Uh, centuries actually following this transfer. And then as a, the great focus is on the slaves arriving in Virginia in 1619. Now, of course, those slaves were not imported by the Virginians. Uh, this was a slave, this was a British ship which had captured a Portuguese slaver and brought the slaves here and offered them for sale. And effectively, they were indentured, considered indentured servants at the time. 
Um, there's very little ability to to trace the individuals, but I believe uh, there's a strong case to be made that one of those, at least one of those individuals, uh, became a free man and fairly wealthy man with slaves of his own um, in the decades following. But it's not at all the way it's generally presented. And in the whole early period in Virginia, from 1619 to basically the 1660s, uh, you have a, a workforce which is largely indentured servants. A lot of those indentured servants are actually people that are picked up off the streets in Britain and, and you know, kidnapped basically uh, because they're vagrants um uh, because they uh want to empty the debtors empty the prisons um and they have too much too many poor kids on the street um and they basically kidnap them and send them over to work in the fields and many of them die very soon uh, there's a interesting book uh on this question um which i'm forgetting the name of at the moment but which indicates as many as 300,000 of these uh, unfortunates get picked up and brought to the southern states of, of uh, southern colonies of North America and get uh, treated quite brutally. And the blacks, you know, who are there work alongside them um, gradually as it becomes harder and harder to get actual indentured servants, uh, and apparently this is cracked down on this kidnapping operation, um, the planters decide that it's much more profitable to import slaves than it is to rely on this unruly workforce. Uh, and they begin to escalate. The real turning, one of the real turning points is Bacon's Rebellion. Um, and where blacks and whites are both involved in trying to overthrow the uh, powers that be. And therefore, ra the race card is played to uh, make it safer <laughs> for the existing uh, oligarchical plantation system to continue to exist. So uh, it happens gradually over time. I have the particular details in the book. I'm not going to go through exactly what those are. But the codification of slavery does not really occur until 1662, uh, when you begin to have in the laws of Virginia that Black people are slaves uh, and slaves for life. Um, so that is... Uh, at the beginning, that is not as draconian as it becomes. Um, as over time, it becomes more and more draconian um, with the numbers increasing, the fear of slave insurrection increasing, um, and the mo models from the West Indies and South Carolina uh, becoming uh, popular uh, and used by those in power in Virginia. So by 1705, you begin to have this kind of code that has no restrictions on the power, no legal restrictions on the power of the slaveholder over their enslaved population. Um, so that is, basically the outline of this chapter. I used Virginia as a major example of, a, of the evolution of this process. So the third chapter, then I go into, I hone in on a, a, a number of particular states where the process is more uh, instructive, I think, of the overall process that's going on. Um, and this is uh, 
South Carolina and Georgia. Starting with Georgia, right? If you looked at the blog, you know, I've done posts on a lot of these issues, but this being Georgia having been founded on the basis of banning slavery. Uh, I mean, I always was hoping that there would be some politicians in Georgia that would use that in the current political situation. I think it would be quite interesting. But Oglethorpe was a humanitarian. He was trying to help people who were in uh, debtor's prison, uh, who obviously were not uh, going to have a life, <laughs> um, and uh, to bring them to the uh, to the colonies and set up a going operation. And he set it up initially with the support of the parliament as a charitable operation, but it had a uh, time limit on it that by 1750, it would revert to the crown. So, but he brought it here. He, you know, very interesting. He he had a, a limit of how much, many acres the uh, residents could have. The, uh, you know, the trustees, they had trustees, not uh, owners, uh, could not have massive land holdings. Um, the land had to be worked, it had to be improved. So uh, it was a, and they weren't allowed to have rum and they weren't allowed to have slaves. Um, they, he had a whole number of kinds of immigrants uh, in addition to those who were in debtor's prison. One of the more significant are the Salzburgers, refugees from Austria, who were also uh, looking for, they were who were looking for religious freedom. And I guess the those in Britain decided to, uh, that this was a good place for them. Um, they were very much with Oglethorpe against slavery, as were the, um, I think the Highland Scots, uh, the lowland Scots were the bums, but um, the uh, who went the other side. But so he had people within. He he didn't really choose his his uh, immigrants on their political leaning, but uh, these were some who were extremely attuned to uh, what he wanted to do, which was to. Uh, keep slavery out of there. And of course, the place was surrounded by slaves, uh, slavery. It was surrounded uh, by the, in the South, in Florida, by Spanish slavery, and to the North and East by South Carolina, by the Carolinas, uh, which we'll get to next. Um, but these uh, Salzburgers succeed, you know, were key examples of how you could grow rice in the climate of the South and do it very profitably without slavery. Um, so they were extremely useful to Oglethorpe in that respect. The um, person who did a lot of work on this was, uh, I'm forgetting, uh, um, I'll, I'll, you'll remember who it is. One of you, one of you Canadians up there, um, Nancy Geis's brother. Um, so, but they were up at the begin from the very beginning, both on the continent here and obviously in Parliament against the backers of South Carolina. Uh, this was a group of wealthy uh, aristocrats who were paid off by. Uh, King Charles II with this land grant on, in North America, which they called the Carolinas. Uh, and this is one of them, the Earl of Shaftesbury. Now, a lot of these guys had previously set up plantations in Barbados, which was one of the most vicious slave uh, islands in the West Indies with a, a 
a slave code that would make your hair curl. So, um, but the the land availability was obviously very restricted in bar in a, in an island like Barbados, and they wanted you know to be able to expand as all slave operations generally do uh, require that. So they got this land and a lot of them, and some people actually called South Carolina a colony of Barbados. Uh, so effectively, South Carolina began, it's, it's the only colony that I know of that began with the with slavery codified in its founding documents. You're probably all familiar or many of you are with the Constitution written by John Locke for the Earl of Shaftesbury, uh, which included uh, slavery as one of the elements. So this was a totally different culture and they were livid at the fact that Oglethorpe had this place right next door, which banned slavery and they were constantly trying to entice the, po the population of Georgia to go uh, to say, why should you work so hard? We've got these slaves, you know, you should really import slaves. This would be make life a lot better for you. Um, and effectively they, you know, essentially they, eventually they win. Uh, and we get slavery in Georgia notoriously for the next centuries. And then I hone in on Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, as I said, was not as pristine as I always thought it was <laughs> from the grand uh, aspirations, religious aspirations of Winthrop and the Puritans, but they, uh, you know, they did allow uh, slavery to exist, and and it grew uh, and didn't get clamped down on, but they also had very early opposition to that, mostly on the religious basis. Uh, the first one being 1700 by Samuel Sewell, uh, saying man stealing is a violation of uh, the laws of God. Uh, forget this idea that slavery is justified by the Bible uh, and stop it. And he literally, he actually worked to free a slave uh, in a court battle. So he, this was not all rhetorical. This is very short, and it's in the appendix of the book. Um, you had Cotton Mather, uh, slightly less radical, you would say, but someone who was attacking the idea that those who were enslaved, Blacks who were enslaved, were of a different species or, you know, were not human in the same way we were, uh, could not be educated, were destined to be in a lower class. And he you know, he prominently pursued the education of blacks uh, that would counter that whole idea. And then it really takes on political life much later on. I'm obviously skipping over a lot of things that happened uh, in 1764. James Otis, if you know your American Revolutionary history, is noted for having been the leader in the fight against the writs of assistance. Those writs of assistance were basically uh, uh, search warrants, uh, unlimited search warrants by that were issued by the British Crown in order to supposedly stop smuggling, right? So he wages the fight on that. Then he writes a pamphlet about basing his opposition to that in British natural and natural law and common law, and he decides to throw in the uh, aspect that this should not only mean liberty for uh, white British uh, citizens, but also for blacks. And he writes famously uh, this quote. Um, does it follow the right to enslave a man because he's black? Uh, and he says, you know, actually tolerating this uh, makes every, 
every dealer in it a tyrant. That's a quote. Something like that was said by Thomas Jefferson um, 10 years later, and everybody praises him to the skies for it. But here it's in Massachusetts in 1764, and very widely circulated. There's a popular, broad popular circulation of anti-slavery ideas in Massachusetts. And that goes so far with the Sam Adams, who of course is a revolutionary all the way through, uh, to having bills presented in the general court or the state legislature, actually not only to end the slave trade, but to end slavery itself. Those are banned, squashed by the crown through the governor, um, and uh, things remain at a standstill on that question. And then Pennsylvania, again, a, a colony established on the concept of religious freedom and a, a great deal of honorable, uh, high-sounding high sounding ideas. But the uh, there were slaves in the Pennsylvania area, basically from the Dutch, I think, um, when Penn got his land from the crown. Um, he didn't get rid of it. Uh, and it actually grew over the course of the first part of the night of the 18th century. But very early on, there was opposition. Um, this came from the German end of things, um, uh, starting in Germantown, Pennsylvania, where a petition against slavery was written. This was written for a Quaker audience. Uh, it wasn't written for the government per se, but it is uh, uh, considered one of the first oppositions to slavery in the American colonies. And it has a great deal of impact. Look at this, you know, this is the Pennsylvania legislature banning, attempting to ban slave imports, to tax it out of the, out of, make it, use a confiscatory tax basically against importing slaves. Uh, it does it three times, and every time the crown vetoes it. Um, and then you have agitation. Uh, this is by a whole number of prominent Quakers. Some of them are uh, stay within the meeting house orbit. Um, others are out in public. Uh, and this guy, Benjamin Lay, this is a painting of him at the time. He was a dwarf, so he did look, I don't know if he looked like this exactly, but he was an unusually shaped man, uh, were on a rampage uh, to be able to uh, agitate against slavery. This guy would go into Quaker meetings and spatter blood on people and things like that. Um, in order to show what slavery actually represented. Um, and, and his writings, he wrote considerably, were published by Benjamin Franklin. Um, Franklin wrote, uh, published a number of them. He obviously, what people say today is he obviously in his papers also published ads for runaway slaves, but he, he associated himself with these radical anti-slavery agitators as well. And then in his very well-known article of 1751 on observations concerning the increase of mankind, which is a promotion of manufacturing and in the colonies, he takes aim at slavery per se, indicating that slavery's impact on the economy is uh, a negative one. Uh, he takes this out of strictly the rural, the uh, moral argument against slavery to say there's also an economic argument against slavery. This is an important uh, shift because it hits this whole idea, which is very prominent for um, for two two centuries here on in the American colonies. That well, slavery is a 
terrible, in, it's really bad morally, but it's economically necessary. And he's saying, you know, forget it. It's not economically necessary. Uh, in fact, it's economically destructive. Uh, so uh, Pennsylvania as well has Benjamin Rush, writes a pamphlet against slavery in 1774. And this is really uh, an eye opener in terms of the breadth of the argument. It is very widely published. Um, you know, he takes on the idea that blacks have a lower intellect. Uh, he takes on the, Bi the idea it's sanctioned by the Bible. He takes on the idea that blacks are uniquely physically uh, adapted to hard work in the hot sun and uh, to do, you know, to uh, take care of crops and so forth and so on. So it's just uh, extremely uh, modern in the in his argument against the modern arguments. Now, I go from there to dealing with this question of uh, the revolutionary period, which really, as you know, heats up in the 1760s. Um, and here is a constant picture of the, the colonists moving to either ban the slave trade or slavery itself through taxes or uh, through other means. And in one after the other, the crown agents block that anti-slave operation. So that what is said by Thomas Jefferson, which people you know poo-poo, uh, that the British were responsible for keeping slavery here is clearly documentedly true. Um, and then some dramatic things happen um, on this whole fight. Uh, one being the Somerset case of 1772, uh, where the Lord Mansfield in England is forced effectively to set, to prevent the kidnapping of, of this fellow, uh, James Stewart, uh, Somerset, um, to, uh, who, had, who had run away from his master to be sent back to the Caribbean uh, to be enslaved. Mansfield did not declare slavery uh, unconstitutional or off bounds in Great Britain, but he did say that you would need a positive law to allow you to uh, to do what the so-called owner of Somerset wanted to do. And this was a major event in the, particularly for blacks, both blacks in Britain and in the uh, south of the United States and in Massachusetts, which was already red hot on the slavery issue to say, okay, we have sanctioned now, uh, slavery is illegal. Uh, we should get rid of it. Um, and you had an enormous impact of the poetess Phyllis Wheatley, whom you may be familiar with, um, come as a young girl, seven or eight. Uh, and she was brought to Massachusetts uh, and she learned English with her, her owners, the Wheatleys, uh, had her educated. She was very bright. Uh, and she began writing poetry, you know, very cleverly also patriotic poetry uh, in praise of Washington uh, and the revolution and so forth. And, you know, people were so, the prejudiced people uh, in Boston uh, made you know, decided that they should stop at this. This poetry couldn't really have been written by this uh, young girl, young black girl imported from Africa. So they actually ran a trial. There's a wonderful book called The Trial of Phyllis Wheatley by Henry Gates. Uh, but the, and she, they had to, they so they interrogated her and they came to the conclusion that she actually wrote this poetry. So that's, uh, What's uh, uh, that became a major sensation 
in terms of an argument against slavery. And in the First Continental Congress, uh, then the slave trade is banned. And it's actually not just banned uh, from Great Britain, but it's banned universally. And in, the ban is enforced, not from north to south. I have to move a bit faster. Then the first abolition society established 1775. Uh, that's by this. And then the real hoo-ha-ha about uh, British that is used to say that the British uh, were more anti-slavery than the Americans is Lord Dunmore's call for freeing the slaves uh, in order to defeat the uh, rebellion in, in Virginia. Um, this was very much of a, of a fraud. <laughs> um, the, uh, it was the slaves of the rebels only. Um, and it also, uh, there was also terrible treatment of the people who were uh, who fled to his to his uh, standard, and uh, the vast majority of them died from sickness. Um, so uh, then I deal with the Declaration of Independence. Interestingly, prior to that, and to build up to that. Uh, an anti-slavery Congregationalist minister in Rhode Island issues an open letter to Congress demanding that the Congress, this is the Second Continental Congress, outlaw slavery in order to be consistent with the demands for liberty from Great Britain. Uh, that, of course, doesn't happen, but uh, if that document is uh, widely circulated. I publish uh, large excerpts in that. Uh, the way I see the declaration is the essence is in its preamble. Uh, the listing of the crimes of the uh, crown are just that, a listing of crimes. They're not statements of principle. This is the statement of principle. Um, and I see it the way Lincoln saw it, that this was a they had no power to confer liberty to everybody. They meant to declare the right, so the enforcement of it might follow as fast as circumstances should permit. Uh, and that's very much what he thought uh, of the Declaration and its universality. It was universal. Of course, it was not uh, implementable in the immediate period, but it was a standard that would be enforced as soon as that was possible. And in this whole fight with the Declaration being discussed with the Phyllis Wheatley, with uh, the Somerset case, and so forth, uh, the where Blacks could, they began to agitate for apply that to getting their freedom. Uh, this ha could happen particularly in Massachusetts where from the beginning, blacks, black slaves even had the rights to go to the courts and sue for their freedom. Um, and, that, and then you had the whole fight to get blacks included in the Revolutionary Army. They, I mean, long story short, the through the course of the entire war, the American army of the revolutionary period was the most integrated army uh, that existed up until uh, Truman uh, desegregated the US armed forces. Blacks served with whites, they served with them in the militia, they served with them in the Continental Army. Um, was there discrimination? Absolutely. Uh, was there, uh, did blacks get freedom from slavery after the war was over? Many did, uh, but um, 
the uh, whole process was an integrated one, and people have, are in, working on this a lot uh, to uncover exactly how many. It used to be considered 5,000. Now, some are saying up to 15,000 joined. I mean, the point is constantly made in civil rights meetings that I've gone to, and I've gone to many recently, that, you know, the Blacks, the enslaved people went with whatever side looked like they were going to promise freedom. Um, and uh, the some of them went, I mean, more most of them went with the revolutionary side in New England, um, in the South, you know, the percentages were probably quite different, but it all depended on what they actually uh, thought their prospects were. So then you come to the uh, post-revolutionary period, and this is really the high, in a sense, the high point of the moral and anti-slavery movement. Um, Vermont, which is not even a state yet, is the first one to write a constitution banning slavery. Then other states begin, the 20, you know, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, then other states remove restrictions on manumission. Before that, it was, you could not manumit a slave legally uh, without it being approved, especially by the legislature. Uh, the uh, liberalization of these manumission laws. Uh, the other thing that was said in manumission laws is you had to provide money. You manumitted a slave, you had to provide money to support him or her or fa the family. If they couldn't uh, support themselves, those were liberalized. Uh, uh, Connecticut and Rhode Island abolished slavery over and gradually, all this is gradual. And the number of free blacks rises significantly. Manumission societies, are, new manumission societies are set up. There was that one in Pennsylvania in 1775, which was pretty dormant uh, during the revolution. But then New York is set up. That is, it's, it is, people say it wasn't abolition, it was just manumission. But in fact, if you look at its preamble, it says endeavor by all lawful ways to give enable Blacks to share equally with us that civil and religious liberty. That is manumission. Um, the, and very importantly, that uh, manumission society and many others establish uh, educational institutions. This one in New York City uh, was a, uh, educated thousands and thousands of young Blacks Slaves, slaved and uns and uh, free, uh, who became important fighters for civil rights in the next generation. And then, of course, the you know, on the national level, the Northwest Ordinance uh, is a major uh, accomplishment of that entire period. And by the time you hit uh, the Constitutional Convention, this is a situation. You've got, uh, you've got, well, I have six states. It's five or six, but well, Vermont's not really considered a state. So most people say five. All these states allow black property owners to vote. There are property qualifications in every, all but one state. I forget which one it isn't. I think it's Georgia. Um, but they didn't. Uh, it's not clear whether Jack, you know, these states allow it. The only explicit laws against black suffrage were Georgia, South Carolina, and Virginia. So there were blacks who voted in the process of the Constitutional Convention. On the Constitution, this uh, is. Here, what I do in the book is I used Frederick Douglass uh, for the main part, uh, who gave a, a numerous speeches defending the Constitution starting in the 1850s. He had a different view before, uh, and he addresses the so-called uh, slave clauses. Um, he denies 
that the Constitution guarantees the right to hold property in man and says that, uh, in fact, the three-fifths clause gives makes it advantageous for uh, a state to emanumit slaves. So therefore, it's really not a pro-slavery move, but an anti-slavery move. Um, he says that the 1808 uh, deadline for eliminating the uh, slave trade was a uh, step in the right direction um, and was, and everyone thought that that was a step toward eliminating slavery itself. And I think that's true from everything that I've read. And he even denies that the fugitive slave clause necessarily uh, refers to blacks. He thinks it might refer to indentured servants. So he's amazing. And then, the, then objectively speaking, the powers are, that are given to the slave, to the uh, federal government, would allow it to go after slavery. Power over the slave, over the territories, the commerce clause, commitment to the general welfare, and the privileges and immunities clause. That's where you have privileges and immunities in one state, you should have them in the other. And this was noticed, this potential threat to slavery was noticed. Henry, Patrick Henry at the Virginia Ratifying Convention, and he opposed the Constitution, uh, uh, made that very clear. Now, this chapter very much reiterates the arguments that are in my book, Hamilton uh, versus Wall Street. So I'm not gonna spend any time doing it. I'm hoping that uh, those of you who haven't read the book will pick up the book um, and read it. And others are probably familiar with my argument here. Um, so, and since I'm taking quite a bit of time, I will go through this really rapidly. It is worth noting Hamilton from the very beginning, making an economic argument as well as a moral argument against slavery. Um, back in 1774, this is a remarkable document on the vindication of the acts of the First Continental Congress by this young man, very young man at the time. Relaxes sinews of industry, clips wings of commerce, misery and indigence of every shape. And then, as I said, the, the core is what creates productivity. And that requires the development of the human mind, development of industry, provision of federal credit, and so forth. So these are all the things that he succeeds in doing for the bank, encouraging manufacturing. Um, there is also abolition activity that continues. Hamilton was, by the way, uh, a mem not only a member of the New York Manumission Society, but he, at one point a president and then in charge of their legal operations to prevent kidnapping of free blacks. Uh, and New York, the New York Manumission Society is the one that uh, creates a national convention of abolition societies, which is very active for about, uh, uh, 25 years, um, usually overlooked, but very active in fighting slavery and all that time. And there were laws limiting the slave trade taken in the 1790s. Despite the, the fugitive slave law and the 1808 deadline, you know, uh, states banned sla the slave trade where they could, and Congress passed various laws making it illegal to do certain things related to the slave trade. Um, the uh, you know, and th those were pushed for by those abolition societies, and then Hamilton's work with Toussaint Louverture. Now we start with the Jeffersonian sabotage um, right away. These are the changes that Jefferson makes right away. No longer do we push for economic growth using uh, credit. The debt for credit for economic growth, we go the other way, we cancel orders, 
you reduce taxes um, and oppose the manufacturing perspective. Massive expansion with slavery with the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, and in fact, Congress votes to ban not only international slave trade into Louisiana, but also the, the internal slave trade. Uh, and that gets reversed the next year. Um, it has been said that uh, Jefferson was in favor of that reversal. Um, Jefferson's view was that slavery should be diffused throughout the country so that uh, it supposedly that would aid its elimination. We can discuss that later. Of course, there's the Democratic opposition to uh, in favor of Hamilton's policies, but it doesn't get anywhere until after the war, which has shown that Yes, it would have been a good idea to have that national bank and to have developed our roads and infrastructure and our uh, manufacturing infrastructure. So uh, this is, but the Jeffersonians continue even then to reject government national funding, uh, federal funding of infrastructure. In this context on slavery, um, the direction goes with the American Colonization Society. And we can discuss that uh, more, but it's um, it was founded by a guy who was genuinely anti-slavery. It was joined and often led by those who really just wanted to get rid of free, free Blacks so that they could continue to enslave other Blacks. Um, but there were Blacks who were in favor of it, and uh, because they believed firmly that it was impossible for the races to live together after all the atrocities that had been carried out against the Black population. And then there was a huge battle, uh, much more than I ever knew, around the Missouri Compromise. Uh, this guy from New York who introduced that ban, attempt to ban further introduction of slavery. Um, and uh, that his speech, which will be largely in the appendix, uh, was circulated and read all around the country. There were, uh, there were meetings to discuss it. There were petitions sent into Congress. Um, it was, a, you know, the battle went on for a year and a half. Uh, before the actual Missouri Compromise was carried out. Now, it looked pretty dismal in many respects um, because of the, what had happened and not happened over those two decades. But in the 1820s, the Carryites began to make some progress. Uh, and they, but they focus that progress not on slavery per se, but on industrialization, because you had to have industrialization in order to have an economic alternative to slavery. Um, this is Matthew's son, Henry. Um, and he, you know, has he explicitly writes on abolishing slavery, econ the economics needed to abolish slavery, uh, but that comes a bit later. Um, he's basically saying the only way to abolish domestic slave trade and slavery is to have a protectionist policy uh, for industrialization. And the person who really is suited to move this forward, well, there are numbers of them. There's John Marshall, there's uh, Henry Clay, but uh, John Quincy Adams as president is the person who combines that drive for both expansion of industry and infrastructure and a government role for that and a freedom for the enslaved. Henry Clay hits the na nail on the head when he basically says those who are for slavery and those who are uh, the Northern financiers, both of whom were united against protection of industry, tariffs, uh, 
are basically uh, similar because they depend on Great Britain for their livelihood uh, and to keep their policy is British colonialism. And then you have increased abolitionist activity, the first newspaper devoted to emancipation, 1821, the first black newspaper uh, for that, 1827. Um, but at the same time that you've got this industrialization push, you have a massive expansion from the British side financially with agents throughout the South uh, to try to promote the expansion of slavery, to try to convince people to go into uh, plantation owners to go into debt, uh, get rid of their excess, so-called excess slaves by moving uh, some of them out to the Southwest, you know, uh, Arkansas, Texas. Um, this, the, the South is covered with agents, uh, British agents, literally British agents, of banking institutions and factoring institutions to push that development. Uh, then the next thing I do is I hit this whole idea that slavery built the US economy. Um, and this is my main thesis. Uh, there are some books that deal with this, one of them called The Poverty of Slavery by Robert Wright, which has some very interesting development to it. Another one by a guy named Gavin Wright, um, W-R-I-G-H-T. Um, and of course it all depends in one way what you say about uh, what constitutes wealth. Is wealth how much money people have is wealth. I mean, there are as a whole school of economists that say the South was richer than the North uh, because if if you count the so-called dollar value of the slaves, and if you just average out the uh, incomes over your population, the ones at the top were making so much, were technically so wealthy. Uh, that they come up with a higher level. But it's all from the standpoint of an actual uh, evaluation of what creates wealth in terms of the ability to produce and provide for your population. Uh, it's a total fraud. Uh, but I take that on. I mean, both these books talk about effectively the experiment that disproves this idea is to contrast the development of the economy in the North and the development of the, you know, the state of the economy in the North and the South, the slave areas versus the non-slave areas. And there are, you know, Southerners who come forward to really argue this point. One key is being this guy, Hinton Helper, uh, whom you can read about on the blog. Uh, and he does charts that just compare the absolute impoverishment in certain areas in infrastructure and rail and in manufacturers uh, being the ones that I find most useful. And there were anti-slavery economists at the time, besides Henry Carey, who basically is just getting started in the, uh, in the 18th 1840, 1830s, anyway. Um, so we've got this guy, Daniel Raymond, uh, who has a whole book. Uh, he actually ran for office on an anti-slavery ticket in Maryland, of all places. Baltimore was a leading area of anti-slave activity in the 1820s. Amazingly enough, when you think of what it was like on the eve of Lincoln's assassination. And then you've got the Jackson turning point. And this you're probably somewhat familiar with. Um, this is the thesis. Um, and that's what put us on the path to civil war. Uh, so basically the people who created Jackson and won his election, the Democratic Party, was a, a pro-slave alliance. It was uh, 
Martin Van Buren and the, the pro-slave uh, junto in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, and they were behind ensuring that Jackson went with his gut, right? Because he had he's not a thinker really, um, to destroy the Bank of the United States on this uh, and effectively to support the uh, what he called the better part of the population, the, the farming part of the population. And this is John Quincy Adams's warning in 1833 after Jackson had vetoed the bank, had vetoed the bank uh, that if this proceeds, what he is doing, which is cutting off the manufacturing sector. That was his, uh, Jackson's argument against the bank was that it, it was supporting the manufacturing sector, giving them special privileges, and that was against the interest of us farmers, right? So it says, once you do that, right, you are threatening the dissolution of the country by a complicated civil and servile war. Um, there was, uh, this was punctuated by the, you know, one of the biggest slave uh, revolts in, in the early history, uh, which was Nat Turner's rebellion. And, but interestingly there, it actually spurred a debate in the Virginia state legislature uh, over whether to abolish slavery or not. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, but Carey comments later that, uh, that that was the last time such a debate happened uh, because of the fact that the Jackson policies went through. And from that time on, he he measures the growth of the domestic slave trade and the pro-slavery feeling. Now, I just lately, since I've been doing classes on Lincoln and so forth, figured that I had to throw in something about the fact that of what happened when slavery was banned and eliminated. So this is a, just a very short uh, chapter on which basically elaborates the fact that the fact there was no economic provision for the slaves to support themselves or nor was there an impetus to a successful impetus to industrialize the south uh, meant that the victory against slavery was if not, I wouldn't say stillborn, but it was actually uh, truncated uh, in its impact for the lives of African-Americans and for the lives of the country. So I go through a few of the things that did happen on the positive side for those who were trying to get an economic component of liberty in there. Uh, the four 40 acres and a mule, actually, there was no mule in the original, but it was just 40 acres as early as January 1865, approved by Lincoln. Uh, the fight in Congress by Thaddeus Stevens and uh, Pig Iron Kelly, uh, one of the August congressmen. Kelly actually, after Lincoln's death, went through the South and agitated for reindustrialization, re uh, speaking to audiences of Blacks and Whites uh, to tell them that that was the pathway. Uh, but that effort for industrialization was squelched uh, by the bankers led by this creep, uh, J.P. Morgan. And then I conclude with a very simple statement that while I could hardly hope to give you an answer of how to deal with the legacy of this uh, problem which faces us so much today, um, 
these are three essential elements. Um, and that's it. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. That was that was very good. That was a really good um, just reference piece now for people to go back to and revisit because um, you just did such a good job just painting a picture. Uh, I didn't think you were going to go back that far, but you did to the very founding of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and even before that to our present day. So this is a really good thumbnail brushstroke. I've got a few questions in my mind, but I'm sure other people do as well who are listening. So um, let's open up for questions. I, I usually ask people to rate, write their names in the chat box and I'll call upon you or rate, raise your little digital hand if you want to do that. You can do that as well. Um, otherwise, I guess I, I got a, um, a, a what might be considered maybe a trivial question, but I'm not too sure if it is. I'd like to get your words. I have my own thoughts on this, but why would for those who say, well, why didn't the Founding Fathers simply just give uh, slaves the full vote? And why did they wait 20 years to abolish the import of new slaves? What would you say to them? And I just wanted to get you um, on record just how I'd like to know how you would respond to that popular uh, criticism. It definitely was the question of whether we would have a country or not. I think that those who were most anti-slavery going into the uh, Constitutional Convention uh, were most concerned with national unity because we were breaking up, because we were fractured, right? Every co colony was fighting every other colony for for uh, income, for uh, to avoid paying, <laughs> to do all kinds of things. Um, and they knew that we were in danger of losing everything right away. The British hadn't left the forts, right? The British were still carrying out economic warfare against our uh, our exports. Um, the there was the British were encouraging unrest on the frontier. There. We were effectively still under siege, even though we nominally had our independence. And I think that was foremost in people's minds. So when Georgia and South Carolina said, we will not join, which they did explicitly, we will not join if you act federally against slavery. They, and, and at the same time, they felt as as many people did, that I mean, there are quotes from congressmen from Connecticut, from congressmen from Pennsylvania, and others that you know we think slavery is on its way out. After all, they had effectively banned it through the Revolutionary War, right? Uh, so it's not like not ban slavery, but they banned the trade and they excuse me. And they really felt it was on its way out. So I think that's why. I think they decided that that it was that they thought it was going to die down. They did ensure certain federal powers. You know, John Rutledge of South Carolina didn't want, didn't even want. The Fed, any indication that the federal government controlled uh, anything about slavery, including the endorsement of the Northwest Ordinance, right? Which was a precedent for saying that it was the federal government. And actually that banning of the, uh, that section on 1808, uh, gives the federal government authority over the slave trade. Well, he didn't want the federal government to have any authority on the slave trade. So they felt that they had gone as far as they could go without risking not having not having those states in the country. And if they did have those that didn't have those states in the country, they thought that that would increase the 
potential for the imperial powers who surrounded us to dismantle what we had won. Mm. That's what I would say. No, that's really useful. Thank you. Uh, Stephen has a question. I do. Uh, thank you, Nancy. I, I really enjoy that. Um, as a kind of a layman in the field of history or, or an interested observer, I look at your wonderful lecture and, and others kind of like it. And what I see uh, um, in terms of the great value of it is it gives us a more accurate understanding of the mosaic of history so that we can better understand where we are now. Um, and I, and what I see going on in the world today to me seems like almost a covert but intentional thrust to kind of reverse economic growth and take a lot of us back to techno surf status, um, which some may agree with, some may not. As a historian and what you've uh, researched and learned with your book and, and um, the slavery aspect, what lessons would you take and share with people today about how to apply this knowledge? Sorry for the sorry for the curveball there. Yeah, well, I try to, uh, unlike my dear friend Matt, I try to stay out of current politics right now. Um, I try to say learn history uh, because if you don't know, if you don't understand the fights that happened to create our country. Um, if you don't understand principle, you know, economics from the standpoint of the principles behind the particular measures, then you can't deal with the problems that we have today. Uh, uh, I certainly, you know, it terrifies me when people respond to things like, uh, me when I go places to try to sell my book, for example, my Hamilton book, and people say, "Well, people don't read, right? You can't do that. You've got to do a sound bite. You've got to do this." And people don't read today. You know, they do. You know, they do a video. You've got to do a five-minute video. You know, it's that's terrifying to me because I don't see us surviving as a civilization if people don't read. You know, if they don't think, if they don't, so. Many of the of the points of emphasis that I make in my history are certainly relevant to principles that have been abandoned today that I am pointing to as how important they were there. And it's in my mind that they sh should, should be applying them today. But I don't want to get into saying, and today, you know, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, which I've done in the past, but I, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm trying to get people to take seriously educating themselves, um, uh, educate themselves on what was actually, uh, the crucial battles in history and, and for best prepare themselves to deal with what, with what's going on today. Yeah. Great answer. Thank you. Uh, to a tough question. Yeah, I think it was uh, John Adams who said that the, this republic is it was made specifically for a religious and moral people and is wholly unfit for any other. But he should, I think we could add also literate people uh, to that as well. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, I got a quick question on... Um, the Netherlands, I never really thought about this until you just brought it up, but it, I realized that what a blank spot this is in my mind, that the Dutch possessions of New Amsterdam and the, and the colonies were given over to England and uh, on the condition that slavery be maintained. I, I didn't realize that. And I was curious, did this have something to do with the Glorious Revolution of 1688 or was this even before that, that this all happened? This was before that. I mean, the, the handover happened in 1664, right? Why did that happen? In six, why did the ha it happen? Why did the Dutch give off their their possessions? Yeah, in the Americas. I, you know, I think I knew, but I don't remember right now. Um, it it obviously had to do with whatever they they didn't find it worth fighting for. Um, 
perhaps <coughs> perhaps due to um, the unprofitability of what they were producing here in America. That's that's what comes to mind. I I don't I don't think it was a, there was a war somewhere that they were fighting. I mean, the other role of the Dutch, which is really fascinating, <coughs> is they were major uh, plantation owners in Brazil and uh, developed the, the sugar trade there. And it was they that uh, and their methods that were applied in the Caribbean to make the Caribbean the sugar islands. Uh, so, I mean, the Dutch played a major role in the development of the slavery in the whole, uh, in the whole Western hemisphere. Uh, but then they tended to pull back, you know, and not be visible um, in terms of, of their activity, but they were, they were, uh, I mean, and clearly they were not a, a major military power, uh, as far as I know, ever. So they preferred to operate in the financial realm <laughs> uh, in that way. <coughs> but yeah, that, that's right, because like the, the Bank of England was based upon the previous model of the Bank of Amsterdam right, right. decades before, and then you had the Dutch East India Company and their weird relationship with the British East India Company. So that's a very fascinating line of inquiry to, uh, to think about. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, I was really, I, I had no idea that that it was the case that it was the Dutch areas of, of New York and New Jersey where slavery, the resistance to ending slavery was the greatest. But definitely mm. the case. It makes Bergen, a point that's really... Bergen County, New Jersey, you know, was a heavily Dutch mm based area and they that was where the concentration of slaves was and that was uh and new jersey was the last state of the north to go against slavery in 1804 to ban slavery hey, interesting yeah and you you wonder too uh, if that was connected into the south africa uh colony too right because they were originally oh yeah yeah the boers well, yeah. yeah, usually our story is that it was the British, but that may not be the case. <laughs> uh, if you really, uh, if you really un unpacked it, uh, because the Dutch, you know, the Dutch sort of slipped back into the corners, <laughs> you know, in terms of what they're actually doing. It's interesting. <laughs> you know, the Boers, huh? Okay. Got a uh, question from Jerry. Oh, hi, Nancy. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about 1833. You know, you picked that year as where it changes with Andrew Jackson. And I was... Some of the stuff I've been reading and Matt talks about it is also the way that Andrew Jackson treated the the Native Americans, the indigenous Americans, just real genocide against them. And I do you touch on that in your book at all on this? It's really with Jackson, you know, opening up the expansion of slavery, but also the way he treated the indigenous people is just the same outlook to me. Now, I was just wondering if you were able to touch on that at all in your upcoming book. I, no, I don't. Um, I mean, I could, but, uh, but actually to, I mean, my major, emphasis is to try to make as strong as possible the two elements of uh that I laid out at the beginning one is the the depth of the anti-slavery movement before uh you know up to particularly up to the 1800 um which many people 
you know, as, as Matt said in what he wrote before, you know, saw as hypocritical, right? That people didn't really believe that that they should fight slavery among Blacks along with, you know, fighting their mistreatment by England. Uh, but a hell of a lot of people did. There was an incredible a fight all the, all along on that question. So, you know, my my stress is, you know, to make that case as strong as possible because, uh, and also, you know, Lincoln's point about the declaration. I mean, we're dealing here in a, in a world where we're, I mean, it's, you're in Canada, so you don't, aren't coming up against the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. That's not a big deal for you, but it's a big deal here. Um, and and there's a huge danger that that is going to be so smeared with this uh, cynical idea. I mean, Matt said, well, the idea of the U.S. should disappear. I mean, more, it's the idea of the U.S. should never have been created. We should have stuck with the British Empire, you know, and then because they were really more anti-slavery than we. It's, it's just such a lie, right? It's just such a lie. Uh, so that, uh, so I'm concerned to give the depth of the fight against slavery here. And I'm also concerned to then make the point about the necessity of a Hamiltonian or American system kind of economics to end slavery because that, uh, because this argument that the wealth of the United States was built upon slavery is extremely strong here. And that, that uh, chapter on uh, slavery as the cancer of the United, of the American economy is really, I think one of the most important chapters in the book because it goes most directly against what the popular idea is. I mean, people up and down the line, not just radical uh, uh, wokers or whatever, are saying, uh, you know, we had to have slavery in order to build the United States. Um, you could never have developed the wealth that we had without slavery. I mean, I just... It, on principle, it's a lie, right? But I think you it also has to be shown to be uh, in the context of what actually happened in the history of the United States, so. So I think it's beyond the scope of the book um, to deal with Jack. I mean, I totally agree with you that but it's but that's been covered a lot nowadays. There's you know there was a new book done on the on the genocide against the uh, the Trail of Tears and uh, all that. So it's been treated very popularly, and I think people understand it. Uh, maybe that's one reason that uh, he's going to hopefully he's going to be replaced on the twenty dollar bill. <laughs> Who knows when that will ever happen. <laughs> Supposed to be replaced by Harriet Tubman or something, but you know, which would be great. But I'm not going to wait for. <laughs> I'm not going to hold my breath. Well, Nancy, I, I this was a, a really wonderful presentation. I'll, I'll give people I, I'll give people one last chance to ask you a question. So if if anybody has a pressing, burning question they want to throw out. Uh, before we we round it up today, I'll, I'll I'll give you the the floor now, or forever hold your peace, or hold your peace till you're. Don't eating. hold your peace. I, I mean, people, <laughs> you can give them. Uh, well, my last slide had, you know, you can give people my email, you know, yep. the the, uh, the blog thing, and and I just would urge if if people haven't read Hamilton versus Wall Street, would urge you to, and if you have please put a re small review on Amazon. I have about 50 promises 
of people who said they would and haven't. So, you know, I, I've gone about four months without anybody doing it. And people come up to me and say, oh, here's my favorite story, right? Just recently, um, a woman that, uh, a woman who had bought the book a few months ago said, my husband read your book and he loved it. And he works on Wall Street. You know? <laughs> so, you know, that's just wonderful. But so I said, well, can you, would you have him put something on the Amazon? She said, I'll make it happen. I'll make it happen. Of course, it hasn't happened. But, you know, the uh, it's so helpful. Matt knows that, you know, when you've got people reviewing, um, any of you who are authors know that it's very important. All, it, all you have to say is read it, liked it, read it, you know, somebody else should read it. I mean, I don't know. You don't have to write it at college essay, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, that goes that goes a really long way. So with that, there there's a link to your book in the chat box, as well as for those watching on YouTube, go to the description box. Find a, You'll see the link to Hamilton versus Wall Street there. Buy it, read it, share it, make the review. Um, and go to americansystemnow.com. It's a wonderful website. It's a great resource. I use it all the time, and I encourage other people to do it too. Um, Nancy also, I'm sure, is going to be going on the interview circuit when your new book is published. So if you I'm know hoping to have it out December 1st, but you know, that's but I have to get the all right. I, I see Bruce Torres. Bruce the Torres just gave a thumbs up. He has a TNT radio show. So if anybody else knows people who okay. have to get Nancy's information to them. Nancy, thank you so much for uh, taking the time today. And thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Take care. Bye.